Today is the 200th episode of Let Me Be Frank. Oof. Can't believe we made it this far, but thank you for listening and sticking with us. Um, the National Eucharistic Revival is about to get underway uh, shortly, and we have big plans here in the Diocese of Bridgeport for our part in that revival, what Bishop Caggiano is calling the Eucharistic Renewal here in the Diocese, and he's going to outline all the stuff that is coming up over the next several months here in the diocese to go along with that Eucharistic revival. Keep your radio right here at 13.50 a.m. for all of that news and 103.9 FM. And keep us on your phone with the Veritas mobile app or on your favorite podcast app. And if you are listening to Let Me Be Frank on podcast, be sure to rate us, review us, give us five stars, and help us reach more souls. Check out the Veritas Catholic Network channel on your podcast app to check out more excellent shows from us. And thank you to our sponsor, Foundations and Faith. Foundations and Faith embraces innovative approaches to funding pastoral care programs in the Diocese of Bridgeport. Resources focus on energizing lifelong faith formation and discipleship and fostering a commitment to justice and accompaniment with our most vulnerable. From seminarians to retired priests, from baptism to last rites, from suburbs to inner cities, the reach is broad and the impact is meaningful. For more information, visit them on the web at foundationsinfaith.org. Okay, here we go. This is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. I'm Steve Lee, and it is my great pleasure, as always, to introduce Bishop Frank Caggiano. Steve, good to be with you, my friend. Now that winter has arrived, really has arrived, huh? Oh, my word. With all this snow? Yes. And cold? Yeah, my yeah. hands are... You know, because I have dry skin that comes from my mother. So now I was going doing great until now. And now it's like my hands are like falling apart here from the cold. But it is what it is, right? As mom used to say, it happens to the you living. You need to load up on lotion. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm going to Costco, as I said, after this recording. So let's see <laughs> if they have it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there you go. You'll, you'll get a 10-gallon drum of lotion. <laughs> there you go. Take a bath in it. Okay, so what are we talking about this time around? <laughs> huh? What's on you? What's on your yeah. mind? Ah, uh, well, we got uh, big plans here. Yes, for the Eucharist. We have big plans for here for the diocese and for mm -hmm. uh, our Lord mm -hmm. for the for our our participation in the Eucharist and the Eucharistic renewal. Yeah. And I thought maybe we'd spend some time talking about that because there are a lot more details that have been planned. So I could share those. Talk about the context, right? Because I think that's really important. And also the long-term plans for what we have. So we could begin by just contextualizing. If you remember, the bishops of the United States identified um, a Eucharistic revival as really important in large part because of some of the surveys that were done among Catholics asking them if they believed in the real presence. And if you remember, if you watched uh, Bishop Cousins' presentation, um, what was also quite, quite surprising is that those Catholics who believed the Eucharist to be only symbolic actually believe, a portion of them actually believe that they were believing what the church teaches. In other words, that they believed the church was teaching that the Eucharist was only symbolic. So it was seen as a failure of catechesis and, and teaching the faith, um, at which I would agree, but I think it's only part of the issue. And that is why we have gone a different route. Because there are other parts to this issue as well. So for example, the role that the, the heart plays in the mystery of the Eucharist is extremely important in my mind. Remember, truth is conveyed in many ways. It's conveyed conceptually, involving the mind, conceptually. That's how you deduce, right? That is how you can reason to something. That's how you affirm it. But there's also an element where there is an engagement of what I'm going to say, the heart. Because when you speak of the Eucharist, 
you are you are encountering the person of Christ. And every time you you or I or anyone encounters Christ, we're encountering him in three particular ways. At least that it, he addresses the whole person. So he addresses the mind, he addresses the heart, he addresses the will. And I think from our point of view, yes. there has to be work done to engage the heart. Uh, we've spoken about adoration before. To go a little bit deeper, what does that mean? It is not just a theoretical understanding of what the Eucharist is, what we believe the Eucharist to be, not just a theoretical understanding of the celebration of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass and what we believe that to be, but it has to be a lived experience of praying at the Eucharist at Mass. And that, quite frankly, needs a lot of work in a lot of different places, where the celebration of Mass is not necessarily an occasion that brings someone to, um, if I may put it this way, for an emotional right, or affective involvement in the mystery of the sacrament. I've told all those stories before. I'm not going to repeat them of my own boyhood. But I think we have to ask ourselves the question, if when we now create the architecture of our Eucharistic renewal, I think we have to ask ourselves the question then, what concretely will we do to be able to allow the experience of praying at Sunday Mass to engage not just the mind, but the heart and demand a response in the will. What are we going to do? And it has nothing to do with the ritual. It has everything to do with what we call the Ars Celebrandi on the part of the priest, which is to say, how does he come to the altar? Is he ready to truly lead this prayer? Is he, do, is he prepared? Is he prepared certainly to preach a message that people can apply in their lives? And does he have an appreciation of every role of the Mass? So it's both the Word of God, it's both the fourfold action of the Eucharist, it's also um, the role of silence and the role of music, and all the rest, right? Gesture, symbol, presence. So we, in the Eucharistic revival, there is some of that. We're going to very much emphasize that in ours. So there's, there's an immediate, immediate distinction between the Eucharistic revival. I speak of the Eucharistic renewal. Because the other piece of this puzzle is, I'm not exactly sure that all those statistics are correct, right? Did you wonder, Steve, when you heard those statistics, I forget what it was, 60%, 56%, 70%, don't believe in the real presence. Did you actually take that at face value? What do you think? I, I didn't really, <laughs> I didn't really analyze it or think about it. I mm -hmm. was just so shocked at mm -hmm. the big number and, mm -hmm disheartened mm -hmm. um uh but but i never thought about you know okay how does this break down what does it actually mean you know how were the questions asked um who were they asking i didn't i didn't think about yeah, you that see stuff. and that is extraordinarily important for us to ask before we actually launch any program of renewal and i have my wonder like for example let's ask a theoretical question in the 14th century 13th century, 12th century, 18th century, how many Catholics could actually articulate what it meant to say that there is the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, other than just repeat the fact that it was the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist? And my guess is, very few. They believed it, they believed it, in part, because their experience of attending Mass reinforced the belief. Do you see where I'm going? It's not that yes. they studied it in the catechism, yes, yes. but they experienced it on Sunday. 
that they were something otherworldly, something transcendent, something divine, something that was more than meets the eye, right? That said, okay, yeah. So this is really Christ. It's almost the experience of a theophany, right? Yeah. We, we had theophanies in the Gospels where Jesus appears like in the transfiguration and there's a glimpse of his glory. Well, I asked the question, when people in the 18th, 14th centuries, whenever they went to mass, was there a theophany there? Did they experience something that lent them intellectually, perhaps not to put in words, effectively, and perhaps even on a deeper level in the depth of their soul to realize that there's something more here than meets the eye of just bread and wine, that there is something divine. There's an inbreaking here of something that they may not be able to explain in words, but they know is more than just simple bread and wine. This is really Christ here. Okay. So yeah. in a sense, part of my bias now, this is my bias, and everyone listening could think that I, you know, I, I, I should, you know, get some professional help here. But from my perspective, <laughs> I think the cognitive understanding of who the Eucharist is will make a greater impact and lasting effect in the life of a person flowing from participating in the experience of Mass that literally stops them in their tracks that allows them to ask the question my goodness what is this what what really is going on here yeah so again you could teach about the eucharist and lead to renewal i'm not suggesting you can't do that but i wondered to myself in the parable of the seeds if those are the seeds that were so, that were being sown that with the heat of the secular culture right the burning heat of the set, that those seeds may not dry up in time unless there is at the same time or perhaps prior to that this renewal of the celebration of the holy sacrifice of the mass and that's where we're putting most of our energy in our diocesan yes. renewal now i i could be wrong but i i don't think i am to be very honest with this in, in a sense if I could draw the analogy, right? if someone came to you and said to you, you know, I know when you were a young man and can sp speak about your current wife and said, I know this young woman ruler, she's wonderful, she's bright, she's attractive and tell you all about her, not having experienced her. It's a very different reality than once you've met her and you say, who is that? And then they answer all the questions. <laughs> yes. That's my point. Yes. That is my point. And that is why I've been talking all this time about the one, because the one will allow us, if we participate in it and the opportunities that are arising, to be able to encounter Christ, that is to meet Christ in multiple ways, so that we are not a stranger to the presence of Christ in sacred scripture when we hear the sacred scripture proclaimed at mass. That we're not a stranger to the power of, of silence when we go to adoration of the blessed sacrament. And we sit there saying to ourselves, um, I, I'm not exactly sure how to express who it is that's before me, but I know there's someone before me. And then coming to Mass in that silence, yes. the Lord will connect A and B. The Holy Spirit will make that happen. Or to be accompanied in faith and now start investing in the lives of other people, that suddenly when you come to Mass, your impulse will not be, will not be to sit anonymously in a crowd but to seek out those you know and to make acquaintance and friendship with others you do not know because it's a family gathering together as the foretaste of the celestial banquet. And all of that makes a difference for the desire to go to Mass, which then in the end will lend us to believe, my goodness, so now I can articulate who it is that comes to me here body, blood, soul, and divinity, which is really shorthand to say it's truly, really, fully Christ. <laughs> That's it. 
right here. Right. So I think the one is essential to make this renewal truly transformative. So I think in the end, a lot of people are, uh, I was going to say wasting, a lot of people, it's not the right word, a lot of people are spending an awful lot of time, right, angsting, reacting to those statistics. And now suddenly the statistics are changing in the latest surveys. Well, to your point, a statistician and someone who does these surveys can, could, could do a lot of different things with questions and how they're answered, how they're collated, all the rest of it. I would say don't, I mean, it's a point of concern, but let's move on. Let's figure out the renewal, right? Let's figure out the renewal, right? Yeah. So we've made tremendous progress on that, which I'm going to share the details in a second. But one thing I do want to highlight, that is I asked all the pastors to appoint what I call a Eucharistic representative. And what? And almost all the pastors have done it. I think five have not yet done it. And I'm meeting with them um, to discuss what I would ask of them to do. And what they really are, are going to be collaborators with the pastors. To do what? First, to receive, receive the same information as the pastors do. To be able to um, operationalize on the local level some of what we're going to be offering to parishes and to help us with the logistics of the Mass that we're going to celebrate on June 1st. As well as advertise, if I may use that word, among the people of their parish, all the wonderful events that will occur for the two weeks prior to the actual Mass. And that's the launch of our renewal within the context of the one. So I want to in advance thank all those individuals mm. because at this point it's approaching almost 85 people who are taking on this responsibility for their for their sisters and brothers in their parishes. So they owe our thanks because, you know, just the sacrifice of time and the willingness to, to roll up their sleeves is a big service to the whole diocesan church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, let's go into the details a bit. So as I've said before, on May 19th, the National Eucharistic Procession that is originating at the tomb of Blessed Michael McGivney will be coming into the Diocese of Bridgeport from the Archdiocese of Hartford. And what we have finalized is that it will come via a yacht from the Archdiocese into Bridgeport, arriving roughly at noontime on Pentecost Sunday, which is May 9th at the pier in Bridgeport. So that's going to be quite a sight. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, May, May 9th. 19th. May 19th. May that's 9th right. or May 19th? May 19th, 19th sorry. I was just testing okay. you. You're listening. That's good. <laughs> on uh, <laughs> At the pier in Bridgeport. So now this is the image, right? So, so the Lord, how many times was the Lord oh. in a boat teaching? So he's coming to us, the Eucharistic Lord, in a boat, which is tremendous. Okay. Yes. Now, as, a, as a, a caveat, that begins 13 days of activities, which I'm going to explain in some detail now. But that arrival will not be a large-scale event. It's going to be a very small event. And the reason for that is a couple. Number one, the pier itself is not conducive to have a real significant, beautiful, reverent experience of prayer. It just isn't. There's a park next to it, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. quite frankly, I'm of the opinion that with the Eucharist coming into the diocese, we should go to a sacred space and make the sacred space that is a church the official beginning of our observance. So that is what's being planned, and there's still logistical work to be done, but I believe that the first stop all right, in Bridgeport is going to be a Blessed Sacrament. And at Blessed Sacrament, there will be time for mm -hmm. adoration. There will be time for praise and, ador and, and worship. And for those who wish to begin this procession, which is going to go through the streets of Bridgeport, to be able to gather 
to rest with the Lord, to pray, and to gather the strength because the rest of the evening we will be walking until we reach St. Charles Borromeo Church. Now, oh, wow. I, I don't have the map that? in front of me, but if you add it all up, I'm, 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 now again, my recollection could be faulty, but my guess is that you're probably looking at walking, if you did all of it, you're probably thinking of walking maybe close mm-hmm. to five miles, I'm guessing, about four and a half, five, okay. which is not like onerous, but it's not a walk in the park either. I mean, that's significant distance. Right. Yes. So we're going to design it in such a way that we're going to try to control, if I could use that word, the amount of people. That is, we're going to encourage people in Bridgeport, and if others come from outside, to join us for portions of the procession so that those who are older, those who have children, feel comfortable joining us. So the expectation is not that you have to do the whole thing. Otherwise, we may discourage some people from participating. I'm hoping people will come, and if you know, and if the health doesn't allow for it, maybe walk a single block with us, right? And again, the image yeah. of the Gospels where Jesus mm-hmm. walks by the crowds and people glimpse him, walk with him for a little bit. Others walk with him for it's the same idea, right? It's the same idea. The power of grace is not yeah. bound by the amount of minutes you spend with the Lord, in that sense. Okay, so. Uh, we will, again, if this falls into place, uh, we will leave Blessed Sacrament, and then we will go um, to St. Mary's in Bridgeport. And now there we're going to feature something, and that is, we're going to call it a, a uh, processional station, which means at certain churches, we will not go into the church, we will just simply pause outside the church with an altar erected, we'll be able to sing, we'll be able to pray, we would mm-hmm. do benediction, and then we move on to the next stop. Versus a place like Basakme, where we may go in for an extended period of time. And the idea would be to engage the people of the area so that right. they could be part of the procession. Then the hope would be that we would go from St. Mary's to St. Michael's, the Archangel, which is the Polish church. And then from there, from St. Michael's, we will move Mm -hmm. on to St. Charles. And at St. Charles Borromeo, that would be when we would do a holy hour, which is different from a period of adoration, because as you know, a holy hour includes adoration, but it also includes the reading of sacred scripture. There would be the litany of the sacred heart of Jesus. There would be benediction. And the hope would be that we would be able to include young people in a special way as we gather for the holy hour. This question about Our Lady of Fatima, which is the Portuguese parish in, in, uh, in Bridgeport, they wish to participate for which I'm delighted. There are, there's an idea that they may have their own procession from their church to St. Charles because to swing around, it would just be too long. It would be too cumbersome to bring everybody around. That may work out. There may be an alternative, but the meeting place would be St. Charles. And again, if all works out the way we're hoping, that holy hour will occur sometime between 7.30 and 8 o'clock. We're aiming for an 8 o'clock start at St. Charles. Mm -hmm. And it will go for an hour and a half-ish, and then St. Charles will be open all night for adoration through the night. So that's day one. That that's just day one. Right. And then we move on to day two, which is the twentieth of May. It's a Monday, and the Eucharist will then the procession will go from Bridgeport, Fairfield, Norwalk, and I believe also Richfield. Those four right uh, towns. Now I'm cool. going to participate as much as I can in all of these events. So for anybody who wants to email me, write to me, don't bother those days because you're not getting a response. This is this is the Lord's days and I'm <laughs> going to spend my time with the Lord and with God's people to do this. So um, yeah. every day that ends at one site, we begin in another site. So what does that mean? So all night adoration of St. Charles will end at 8 a.m. on Monday 
and Father Abelardo mm -hmm. will lead the benediction and repose the Blessed Sacrament. I will be at St. Augustine's Cathedral at 8.30 to celebrate Mass and begin the next leg, right, of the mm -hmm. procession. Now, people will say, well, why don't you process from St. Charles to St. Augustine? Well, because there's two pieces to this puzzle. And I could I can answer both of them by asking a question. What's the relationship between the consecrated host and the celebration of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass? And that is one follows the other. We repose the Blessed Sacrament as a mm -hmm. consequence of celebrating Holy Mass. We do it for adoration purposes and so that the sick can be cared for to receive the Blessed Sacrament. So in effect, to have the Blessed Sacrament processed to church and then we would repose it because we're going to celebrate Mass, then the idea would be that the host consecrated mm -hmm. at that Mass would then be the host that would be in procession for the day. So we thought to ourselves to just simply transport uh -huh. the Eucharist to repose it, it really doesn't make any sense. Right, so that is why we're going to start afresh. So 8.30 Mass is right. at St. Augustine. Then we're going to go to St. Margaret's Shrine up the road, right? On the campus of St. Margaret's Shrine, the hope would be that we would have a procession on the grounds with the recitation of the rosary. And then at 11.30, there would be a holy mm -hmm. hour at St. Margaret's Shrine. At 12.30, we will leave St. Margaret Shrine and move on to St. Pius X. Now, there's something here that we also have to explain. And that is, in the National Eucharistic Revival, because they are imagining that they will be crossing states that have hundreds of miles of farmland, they are imagining that the Eucharist would be transported by some vehicle from one spot to another. So we're going to do the same thing okay. so that we would transport the Eucharist. Um, there are special vehicles that have been created to mm -hmm. do this um, so that it would go from St. Margaret's Shrines to St. Pius. And when it arrives at St. Pius, at one o'clock, there'd be a holy hour. And we're going to invite school children to come for that one hour holy hour. There'll be a procession around the campus of St. Pius, which is beautiful. And then it will go from St. Pius to St. Mary's in Richfield. Yes. When they arrive at St. Mary's at four o'clock, there would be a holy hour from four to five. And we'll invite the religious education students of St. Mary's and the neighboring parishes if they wish to come with their parents to come. The hope would be we'd actually have a procession in Richfield, but again, it's all working out the details. And then from yeah. St. Mary's in Richfield, it would go to St. Mary's in Norwalk. Oh, wow. And that at St. Mary's in Norwalk, there'll be, again, another holy hour. Scripture, homily, litany of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, benediction. Please, God, if we could work out the details, we'll have a procession within the city of, of Norwalk. And then there will be all-night all adoration at St. Mary's until the next day. Right? Awesome. Good. Awesome. Is it? Before we get to day three, Excellency, can we take a quick break? Yes, of course. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. Exciting plans uh, are being put into place for the uh, Eucharistic Revival, which we're calling the Eucharistic Renewal here. And uh, His Excellency is going to talk about more of it on the other side of the break. We'll be right back. If you're concerned about your end-of-life plans, searching for a Catholic cemetery, or have loved ones who are buried in one of the 14 Catholic cemeteries throughout Fairfield County, now might be a good time to begin planning for yourself or for other family members. Call one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 to leave a message or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. Many people don't realize that 
that they can be buried with their deceased loved ones, even if all of the family's in-ground plots have been taken. The Diocese of Bridgeport Catholic Cemeteries provides in-ground burials, as well as columbarium and mausoleum options. This makes it possible to unite your family together in the same cemetery, and it's an opportunity to build a bridge for your family back to the church. Talking about this issue is not easy, but pre-need planning makes your wishes clear, reduces cost, and helps your family avoid difficult decisions at a time of grief and loss. You can start your planning now by contacting one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. We can guide you through the options, regulations, and considerations to help you make the best decisions for your family. The number is 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. Okay, welcome back to Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. Okay, Excellency, so an excellent first two days here in the Diocese of Bridgeport. What's next for day three? Mm -hmm. So Tuesday, May 21st, again, there will be benediction at St. Mary's in Norwalk at 8 o'clock, and the Eucharist will be reposed. I will be celebrating Mass at 8.30 at St. Matthew's in Norwalk, and the day's activities begin from St. Matthew's. And after the celebration of Mass, we are going to have a unique experience. We are going to process from St. Matthew's Church to the cemetery, St. John's Cemetery, which is not too far down the road. And we will process among the dead with the Lord who will call them to life from death, reciting the recitation of of the, reciting the rosary while we do that. And I think that will probably be a very powerful experience to give birth to who it is. Whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup, right, will live forever. Mm Mm-hmm. Then we'll go back to St. Matthew's and then at about 11.30 the plan is to go to transport the Eucharist from St. Matthew's in Norwalk to St. Thomas More in Darien. Hmm. And at St. Thomas More in that beautiful church we will have extended adoration like we did for Blessed Sacrament on the Sunday. Hopefully at least two hours of just silence that people can come, spend a few moments to pray, to reflect, to adore, Then we will process on the grounds of St. Thomas More before we leave the campus, which again, beautiful grounds. And they also have a columbarium now, as you know. And then we will transfer the Blessed Sacrament to St. John's Basilica in Stanford. And once again, there will be an opportunity for an extended period of adoration in the heart of Stanford, two hours. And I very much insisted on this because it would be from 3.30 to 5.30 because the procession is good, walking is good, but it's very hard to keep sometimes people focused on why we are walking, what, you know, people yes. begin to kind of chat amongst themselves and I'm, please God, we'll do everything we can to stop doing that simply because, but when you sit before the Lord in quiet adoration, then that is the high point of the possibility of encountering the Lord in his grace. And so I think it's important we do that. And then, um, There would be hopefully a procession somewhere in downtown Stanford. And then we will transport the Eucharist to St. Gabriel's. It'll be a stational church at St. Gabriel's, which means we will not go in. We will go. We will have a moment, uh, you know, some period of time of prayer outside singing. I would presume the Haitian community will guide a lot of that. And and then we will process up to St. Cecilia's, which is not very far. And St. Cecilia's will have the Holy Hour. Adoration, the homily, the litany of the Blessed Sacrament, and all night adoration at St. Cecilia's. And the hope would be if all of this works out, the Holy Hour would start at 8.30 on Tuesday Mm the 21st at uh, at St. Cecilia's. And then the next day is the final day that we have the, the, the privilege of having the Lord with us, right, as part of this national procession. So while the Eucharist is reposed to St. Cecilia's, right, and benediction, then immediately after, I will celebrate Mass in the same church at St. Cecilia's, 9 o'clock, 
with all the students of the Catholic Academy of Stanford and the other neighboring schools, if they wish to come, will process back to St. Gabriel's. Mm -hmm. They'll have holy hour and adoration for the kids, uh, the young people who attend Cardinal Kong and Matus, Matus Salvadoris schools. Mm -hmm. Then we'll transfer the Eucharist to St. Mary's in Greenwich. And there will be a period of adoration at one o'clock, two o'clock-ish, there'll be some procession we're hoping in Greenwich. And then at that point, the Eucharist will leave and cross into the uh, into the Archdiocese of New York where they will continue their events. So cool. So lots of activities, <laughs> lots of activities. People can go. You're going to have to go into training to <laughs> get Well, you know, that's, I, I'm on a diet though. Yep. Yes, I'm on a diet. <laughs> thanks be to God. Right? So... Well, I'm always on a diet, but that's not the point, right? I'll be ready. <laughs> I will be ready. Right. So now, um, that is only the tip of the iceberg because the iceberg is everyone's participation in this, everyone's participation, every parish and community's participation in this. So work has begun in that regard. Each of the nine deaneries, the deans are working with the local pastors to pull together <clears throat> how every parish will be involved. So, for example, we're working on a presentation of the Eucharistic miracles. There are over 160 in history, Eucharistic miracles. So the hope would be that we would... In fact, not the whole the plan is that we will create a presentation that will have an introductory video, video and then the opportunity for people to actually walk through all 160 miracles. Yes. Have posters, yep. explanations, yeah. and then have the opportunity to have adoration while that's going on and also the opportunity in, in some time in that experience to have uh, uh, a theological, pastoral, and spiritual reflection on it by someone who is expert. Yes. Yeah. Right. And I may have mentioned this to you already. I don't remember. But when I went to Legatus and Father Spitzer did that, gave a talk to the Legatus mm -hmm. membership at the summit. Mm -hmm. Right. I, it was a powerful, powerful reminder that we're not talking about magic. Right. Right. We're not talking about. Yeah. Magic. Which we're talking yeah. about interventions of grace to remind everyone who it is that is hidden, if I could put it that way, under the appearance of bread when he's actually no longer bread. Yes. Yeah. So, he's so excellent my guess is we will of, offer that I mean, so. in multiple sites in the diocese and the hope would be in all of our Catholic high schools will have that so that the young people can experience that. We're beginning to gather together how many parishes and deaneries want Eucharistic preachers to come and we will um, petition to have them come and they will either offer 40 hours preaching or Eucharistic missions throughout the diocese. They're also working on having at least one parish in every deanery become a place where confessions will be offered in a sustained way throughout the 13 days so that people will have the opportunity to go to confession and the priests of the area will join forces to make that available. Yes. And there may be others as well, right? One deanery suggested a youth track that there be activities huh. for the 13th solely for youth. This is interesting. And I'll be curious yeah. to see what else comes through. But that, so that er, er, it's leading up to the June 1st mass, which will be at 11 o'clock in the morning at the new arena built for Fairfield University. And that is the eve of Corpus Christi. And at that Mass, I will officially commend all the work we're doing on the One and all the work leading everyone to the Eucharist, which is the destination of the One in this life, right, to the intercession of Our Lady and to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, who are the two to whom this diocese is commended. And that Mass will have representatives from every parish and school and it will be a celebration of our cultural and ethnic and racial diversity, but our unity in Christ. So for what I can gather, there will be seven different choirs that will sing. 
there will be an opportunity for us to have the preamble, which will be an, an hour and a half prior to the start of Mass, where we'll have the recitation of the Rosary. We will have a talk on the beauty and power of the mystery of the Eucharist. We will have other events to prepare ourselves for the procession, uh, for the opening procession and for the Mass. And then at the conclusion of the Mass, it really is at that point the full architecture of the one fostering opportunities of encounter, creating communities or spiritualizing the communities that exist. They accompany each other in discipleship and leading everyone to Sunday Mass. That is the architecture of the one to the celebration of Mass and a celebration that is truly active and consciously participates the life of the faithful because they are being addressed in their totality, mind, heart, and will. And if we do that for a few years, I have every confidence that this diocese will will have a renewal beyond our wildest imagination. Yes. So that is what's being planned so far. It's incredible. It's so exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now, what happens then? Well, we're going to have three years of celebration reminding us of the destination of the one while we continue to build those opportunities and work on our communities, right? So one idea, and I'm curious to see what you think of this, one idea they came up was to have a diocesan Eucharistic retreat for anyone and and everyone who wanted to attend. And um, I thought about it, and I thought to myself, I think that's an excellent idea, but rather than have one retreat, perhaps have four of them. Two in the year of 24-25, two in the year of 25-26. That is from fall of 24 to the summer of 25, and then the fall of 25 to the summer of 26. In four different regions of the diocese so that Mm -hmm. people could come and can plan on coming and it would be four nights monday tuesday wednesday and thursday it would have the celebration of mass followed by adoration and a talk confessions being heard and then an extended period of time after the talk for adoration and to lead us into the greater understanding of the mystery of the Eucharist. What do you think of something like that? Yeah, I love that. I mean, uh, a lot of it (laughs) is going to... Uh, we'll, Depend on uh, who does it, who, who's the leader, who's the retreat master. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> See, you're very polite. trying to think of how to say that. Well, <laughs> <laughs> ah. that's that's yet to be determined. Yeah, that is yet to be determined. A part of uh, my heart it, says to me, yeah. A part of my heart says to me, as bishop, I should do at least one of them myself. But yes. then the question becomes, yes. should it be the same person who does all four or should there be four different people doing them? So I don't know. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's up for conversation. Those are the sort of conversations I'm going to have with the Eucharistic representatives. They, they become the sounding board for this. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I kind of, I, you should definitely do one excellency. Mm-hmm. I kind of like the idea because yes. it, if there were four different speakers mm-hmm. or leaders, then mm-hmm. somebody might uh, have the idea of attending all four. Whereas, let's yeah. say, if we had, if it was the same one all four times, they might say, "Well, I already did that." <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's uh, an excellent point. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Yep, that's an excellent point. The other thing I mentioned once before, we have I've gotten letters from individuals offering financial contributions to create. Eucharistic chapels in their own parishes. Yeah. You imagine? Now that we've yeah. begun to, to, this is beginning to seep in to the fabric of the diocese. Um, in fact, one letter from a very lovely woman um, spoke of a, uh, an, a country in Africa 
in the diocese, one of the dioceses in that country, I forget if it was Cameroon, I forget which one it was, where the bishop um, has mandated that every parish have perpetual adoration. Wow. And and build a chapel for perpetual adoration. Now, for us, I'm not sure we could do that. Um, to a, certainly not to build the chapels in 75 places. But it, it convinced me, convicted me, that the plan to have one at least in every deanery is not only achievable, it has to be achieved in this first year and have people from various yes. parishes come to offer the hours, not just the, the host parish. Yes. And that place could be yeah. the place where you have extended confessions on a regular basis. And if that grows mm -hmm. and it will grow, then seed it in other parishes as well in the deanery. Yeah. I love that. So we're going to put a protocol together for that and announce that in the fall and see who is willing. In fact, in Bridgeport, I'm going to St. Charles in May, I think. Or is it June? I forget. One or the other. I think, no, it's May, where I'm going to inaugurate their perpetual adoration chapel. And others oh, wow. already have them. Others yes. already have them. Question yep. is... Do people know about it? Uh, I was at one of those regional meetings that I had, and people mentioned that they had perpetual adoration, and not a single person outside that parish had any idea that that existed. Hmm. Yeah. Right? So part of this is just to figure out what, it already, what already exists and communicate it to the people of the diocese so that people could go. Right? Right. Mm -hmm. I think we're so poised for this. It's it's like it's it's unbelievable. It really is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I, I love then, excellency. That yes, yeah, Steve, please. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was just gonna say. I I just I love also like your whole approach is. You know, there's one thing to to talk about the science and the miracles, or I mean, miracles aren't science, but you, you know what I mean, like the the mm -hmm. those things that are happening and the apologetics, but uh, but. What I wouldn't have anticipated, and I just love that you are approaching it this way, is the idea of um, the encounter, and, um, and and through through the liturgy and through adoration, the real heart to heart connection with the Eucharistic Jesus. Because, like you said, that is so much deeper, you know, mm -hmm. for for mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now. This raises another piece to this puzzle, which has been on my mind from the very beginning, and I've not mentioned it in any of my presentations in any significant way, except the very first one I did, because I am still, I am still um, reflecting in my own mind how it is we ought to do it. But let me give you an example of what I'm, I'm referring to. If someone's listening to us saying, okay, so this is great, we strengthen the believers, but the vast majority of Catholics are not going to Mass, and those of goodwill are out there somewhere, and they have a hostile world, so how is that going to grow the church? How is that, how is that going to get the charisma, this message of salvation, into the world? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, in my mind, there is one other piece of encounter that we have not spoken about, but now the time is coming to start. So in fact, I have spoken of truth, beauty, and goodness, but there is a fourth that is crucial to the renewal of the church and crucial to the outreach of those people who are no longer practicing the faith and people of goodwill. Now I'm going to put you on the spot. Take a guess at what number uh -huh. four is. Uh, truth, beauty, goodness... Um, I mean, I would think it would be witness, but witness would fall into the goodness. I'm thinking. Is it? Is it? Is it? Oh gosh, I don't know. <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> Invitation. Good try. It may be true, but not what I'm thinking. <laughs> okay. Number four. So it's S. So it's it's T B. G and S. Truth, beauty, goodness, and suffering. Oh, yeah. 
suffering. Suffering is the moment when the cross of Christ is no longer a theoretical concept because I'm carrying my own and I have no choice but to carry it. Yes. See, suffering is the fourth great privileged moment of encounter with Christ. Whether it's the suffering at the hands of our own sinfulness and the moment we're invited to repent like Peter, Mm-hmm. or the sufferings of the frailty of life or disease or the challenges that secular life is creating including falling more and more people into addiction and slavery of so many different types if we want to invite people into the life of the church we have to create bridges in moments of suffering and tell those people they are not alone and by accompanying them gently grant them the possibilities of encountering Christ in truth, beauty, goodness, and ultimately by leading them to the Eucharist where their cross is married to Christ's cross, which is what the sacrifice of the Mass is all about. Yeah. See where I'm going? Yeah. And you may say, okay, so how do you do that? That is the million dollar question. That is why I've not spoken about it And even speaking about it now may be a tad bit premature, but now my heart is ready. Because there are tangible ways by which we could start building this bridge. And in year one of the Eucharistic renewal, on the context of the one, we can start building them. And I'll give you two examples of what I mean. We have a large amount of ministers, extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. We have a good number, good, faithful people. And many of them have not returned back to their ministry, in part because we're not offering the cup in most of our parishes, which some people may disagree, but I respect the pastor's individual decision that they feel it's still not appropriate to do that. And the Council of Trent teaches you do not need to do that because the host is the body and blood of Christ, not just the body of Christ. It's the fullness of Christ's presence. Yes. Anyway, having said all that, a living bridge, a living bridge to those who are suffering could precisely be a renewed ministry of Holy Communion by extraordinary ministers mm-hmm. to be able to give them the resources, the training, the accompaniment and the prayerful support to visit those who are in hospitals, nursing homes, shut-ins, and really visit with them, not just simply not just simply grant them Holy Communion, but to get to know yeah. them and build bonds of friendship with them so that they are not alone. That could be yeah. the most powerful counter. And not only that, my friend, but their families, many of whom are not mm-hmm. churched, Right? You go into a hospital room and there's a family member and you pray with the person, that other person is also praying whether they realize it or not. They, they literally see the hands and face of God in that room. Yes. Okay. So yeah. part of what I want to do is have the Eucharistic ministers gather with them and talk about what tools do they need so that we could focus that ministry ever more in this bridge in moments of suffering. Yes. Right. The second area that we have to explore is the whole area of the youth and how many challenges they face. Adults are not far behind. Can we create a network where in deaneries, perhaps in individual parishes, there are point people there who a parent can turn to just for advice when they suspect that a, a young person is, is falling into an addiction? or if a young person admits to it, to be able to sit and talk with a young person and direct them to real professional counseling. So Mm -hmm. we don't have the means to provide professional counseling for everyone, but we could be the bridge and then accompany the people in this journey just from a far prayerful accompaniment. You see my point? Yeah. That becomes another bridge in the moment of suffering, which then allows moments of truth, beauty, and goodness, right? And it allows the accompaniment that one day we could say, you know, take all your concerns to the Lord here at Mass. 
because he he suffered for you and he's victorious for you he's your hope in this moment right now there's no therapist there's no world there's no oprah winfrey none of those forget it <laughs> they're all important they do their role but it's christ who is the healer christ is the healer yeah see if that is what is in the back of my mind for part of this renewal you see it's not it's more than just the, it's not just focusing on the Eucharist but it's focusing on all the elements of the one leading people to the Eucharist yeah yeah we have much to it. do yep mm-hmm. yes yep so and but we're I think uh, I mean t- this past hour has shown us that this diocese is off to a, a, a really solid start on all the stuff you know, that, uh, that you have planned and that's really at the heart of, of why we evangelize. Yeah. Yeah. I hope so. I pray, just pray that we could stave off the evil one because I'm sure he is not happy and he will do whatever it takes to try to derail this. And we have to put him in his place, which is basically send them back where he came from. Yes. Yep. Amen. Okay, so let's take one final break and we'll uh, come back on the other side with a listener question. This is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. Be right back. Hey, it's Matt from Restless on the Veritas Catholic Radio Network. Each week on Restless, we young adults restlessly seek the face of Christ in today's crazy and mixed up world. Join us each Friday at noon on 1350 AM, 103.9 FM, the Veritas app, or wherever you get your shows. Hope to see you there. All right, welcome back to Let Me Be Frank with Bishop Frank Caggiano. Excellency, I forgot to to mention to you, and I'm glad you reminded me, this is our 200th episode for Let Me Be Frank. Could you imagine? Could you imagine? You've been, you, you put up with me for 200 episodes? Could you imagine? <laughs> these people, these good people listening to me, th- thank God it's Lent. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you were talking wow. about suffering, right, Excellency? <laughs> just... Yes, of course. <laughs> of course. Just... Uh, okay, so let me let me just get to uh, before I get in trouble. Let me get to the uh, the listener question. Here, mm-hmm. the listener wrote in, uh, Bishop Frank, why do some priests read the prayers aloud during the preparation of the altar and the offering, and other priests say them silently? That's a great question. Um, if, if you have not ever had the opportunity to actually look at the Roman Missal, there's the old saying, you know, you do the red and say the black because it's printed in two colors, right? So the red are the directions and the black is the actual acclamations, where words, prayers, etc. So in the Liturgy of the Eucharist, there are three phrases used. It speaks of saying something in a low voice, it says saying something quietly, and it says say, saying something with a loud voice. And if you follow along where the priest says, Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, it says if there is singing, he is to say those words in a low voice. If there is no singing, he is to say them, okay, aloud. The other prayers, when he it mixes water and wine, what he says with humble spirit and contrite heart, it clearly says he is to say those quietly. They are not to be heard. So there's variations because priests are not following what is written here in the Roman Missal. That's the simple answer to the question. Ooh, okay. That was a good question. Um, so was, if you have a question a for Bishop answer? Frank, <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was pretty frank. <laughs> Um, you can send in your questions on social media or you can email questions at veritascatholic.com. Bishop Frank Caggiano is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and so is Veritas Catholic Network. And thank you as always to our sponsor, Foundations in Faith. A grant from the St. Therese Fund for Evangelization makes it possible for us to bring Let Me Be Frank to you. Foundations in Faith is committed to supporting and transforming pastoral ministries in the Diocese of Bridgeport, and you can learn more about their outstanding work at foundationsinfaith.com. Org. Excellency, this is really exciting. We're on the cusp of uh, some fantastic, fantastic events and important things and, and opportunities to worship Jesus. 
Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. May they bear great fruit. Mm-hmm. Yes. So let's so, let's ask the Lord's blessing, yes. shall we? Please. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to use the prayer that came from the first Sunday of Lent. May your bountiful blessing, O Lord, we pray, come down upon your people, that hope may grow in tribulation, virtue be strengthened in temptation, and eternal redemption be assured for your holy people. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Take care of my friends. I'll see you next week. Thanks. See ya.